A History of the Yoruba People. S. Adabanji Akindi. The Kingdoms and the Economy, Part 1. Broadly, in terms of economic development, there are two periods in the long era of the kingdoms in the history of the Yoruba people, from the 11th century to the beginning of the 16th century, and from the beginning of the 16th century to the end of the 18th, with the coming of coastal trade with Europe in the early 16th century as the dividing line. The creation of many kingdoms, cities and towns in Yoruba land from about the 11th century acted as a powerful stimulus to transform economic life. It produced a growing urban culture, which reordered the general economy farming, manufactures, trade, arts and artisanship, entertainments in many ways. Then in the early 16th century, European coastal trade entered upon the scene, generating very significant transformations. In this chapter, we shall look at the whole economic picture and its two periods, again excluding, as much as possible, details that pertain specifically to the Oyo Kingdom and Empire, since Oyo constitutes the subject of a subsequent chapter. The Main Pillar, Peasant Farming The civilization that ultimately produced the Yoruba kingdoms was developed over many hundreds of years by a farming people whose agricultural economy became progressively more efficient and more productive as a result of the growing sophistication of iron tools as well as increasing numbers of cultivated crops. Agriculture was the pillar of the economy before and after the creation of the Yoruba kingdoms. The emergence of the royal cities, as well as other major towns, as the kingdoms were springing up, widened opportunities in other occupations like house building, government and military service, the arts, artisanship, entertainment, priestly occupations, health care and herbal occupations and, very importantly, commerce. But agriculture remained the employer of the vast majority of people in the Yoruba kingdoms. A fortunate combination of suitable soils and adequate rains made most of the Yoruba homeland good for agriculture. The only decisively poor agricultural belt consisted of the coastal lagoons, creeks and swamps, the home of the Itsekiri, Ilohe and Ikale kingdoms, the coastal Ijebu towns and some of the Awari. The inhabitants of these places lived mostly by fishing, and, from ancient times they supplied dried fish to the rest of the Yoruba homeland. Some of them also manufactured salt from seawater and provided the rest of Yorubaland with its earliest supplies of salt. The coming of imported salt from Europe from the 16th century on gradually destroyed the ancient salt industry, but European trade in general opened up new commercial opportunities for these coastal Yoruba people commercial opportunities about which more will be said later. Immediately north of this belt came the belt of Yorubaland's thickest forests the home of the Owo, Ondo, Ijebu and Igba kingdoms. Next came a belt of slightly lighter forests, and finally the broad belt of grasslands characterized by tall grass, scattered shrubs and trees and, along the rivers and streams, patches of thick forests. The thick forest belt, as earlier mentioned, bulged northwards in the area of the Ife Kingdom, roughly central Yoruba land, and then from the Igbado country westwards, the open grass belt bulged southwards near to the coastline, putting much of the Igbado and the far western Yoruba kingdoms, and their Asian neighbors in light forest and grass territory. The Akoko and Akiti kingdoms lay partly in the lighter forests and partly in the grasslands, the Ijesa and Ife kingdoms mostly in the light forest belt, and the Oyo and Igbamana kingdoms in the grassland belt. The lighter forest and grassland belts were the best areas for agriculture in general, the land and the grasslands being considerably more fertile than in the thickest forests. Certain types of yams did particularly well in the valleys and hill slopes of the Akiti, Ijesa, Igbamana and Ife countries, and therefore these kingdoms were the most prolific producers of yams in Yoruba land. The grasslands were the best for cereals, mostly millet and maize, and most types of beans. Therefore, foods made from cereals and beans featured more prominently in the diets of the Igbamana, the Oyo and the Oak in Yoruba. The oil palm grew abundantly in all parts of Yoruba land, somewhat more in the lighter forests and grassland belt than in the thickest forests. Palm oil and palm wine production were very important items of agricultural activity in all parts of Yoruba land. Another type of palm tree called Oguro, Raffia vinifera, did well only in swampy areas in many places along the lagoons and in swamps along riverbanks. Its most important product was palm wine, but it also supplied fronds for a highly valued roof mat. As pointed out in an earlier chapter, cotton and the shrubs from which dyes were derived grew best in the more open country making the Igbamana and Oyo areas the leading producers of cotton and dye stuff. On a journey through these parts of Yoruba land early in the 19th century, the Englishman Richard Lander recorded seeing extensive plantations of cotton and indigo in the farmlands around every town. In the vicinity of Katunga, i.e. Oyoila, and most other large towns, he wrote, indigo is cultivated to an extent of from 5 to 600 acres. The beans from a bean tree, 
locust beans, known in Yoruba as Irugba, that grew scattered in the grasslands yielded a highly valued aromatic called Iru, of which the Igbamana, Oyo, Northern Ekiti and Northern Igesa were the leading producers. The Yoruba type of Kalana, Obia Beta grew well in all parts of the forests, but the large-scale production of it for export to the Trans-Niger countries appears to have been a monopoly of the Ife Kingdom for some centuries. From there it expanded westwards to the Ou, Ijebu and Igba countries and, later, to the Igesa and Ondo countries. Large-scale production of Oragbo developed in much the same way. The raising of livestock was not a significant feature of Yoruba farming. Unlike their northern neighbors, the Hausa and Fulani and others beyond the Niger, the typical Yoruba farmer did not rear herds of cattle or flocks of goats or sheep. In the extreme northwestern part of the Yoruba country, in the Oyo grassland, it was common for rich families to own some heads of cattle, and also goats and sheep, for the care of which they procured labor, as employees or slaves, from beyond the Niger. For the rest, the typical Yoruba livestock were goats and sheep and birds like chickens, ducks, pigeons, and sometimes turkeys all of which were raised free-range around the home, and almost all of which were owned by the women. Most women owned one or two goats or sheep and a few birds, which they raised in their compound homes, some of the wealthier women had many, and frequently derived considerable income from sending a few to the marketplace for sale from time to time. Urbanism A active peasant-based urbanism evolved all over Yoruba land. Surrounding each city or town were farmlands spreading out for miles. Members of the predominantly peasant population of each urban center left home in the morning to work on their farms, and returned to their city or town in the late afternoon. On their farms they built the barns for preserving the harvest, and usually makeshift huts, called Abba, where they cooked and sheltered from sun and rain while away on their farms. These were the daily farms called Okoital, near town, or precinct, farms, which were normally not farther than five miles from the city. Of the farmers who owned precinct farms, a few would also have farms in the more distant forests near the ultimate boundaries of the land that belonged to their city. In such distant farm locations called Okoigan, farms of the forests, there developed small outposts called Abule consisting of small, fragile, family homes. Farmers could stay in the Abule for many days, a few turned the Abule into semi-permanent homes. Small towns or villages called Iledu existed in every kingdom. But the pattern of life in them was the same as in the city with family compounds, near home farms and distant farms. Even in such villages, most residents would claim that their ultimate homes belonged in a lineage compound in the large local town or city. By and large, the ideal home for the Yoruba person came to be an apartment in a lineage compound in a city or town. Emotionally, and almost completely in fact, the Yoruba people, after the creation of their kingdoms and cities, became a nation of urban dwellers. Krap Fiskari describes Yoruba towns and their farms as follows, the classical plan of a Yoruba town resembles a wheel, the Aba palace being the hub, the town walls the rim, and the spokes a series of roads radiating out from the palace and linking the town to other centers. Beyond the walls lie the farmlands, first the Okoitile or farms of the outskirts, then the Okoigan or bush farms, merging imperceptibly with the Okoigan of the next town. Manufacturers the emergence and growth of many cities and towns in all parts of the Yoruba land, and the consequent growing demands of an urbanizing people, stimulated manufacturing in general. In the process, regional specialization was also generated. Over time, the country looked to the towns of the Asin Valley for its best quality dyes, certain types of dyed cloth, and iron goods, to Ife, Ijebu, Ilesa and Ondo for iron products, to western Ekiti, especially Ogotun, and eastern Igesa, especially Ipatu for the best mats and raffia products, to the towns of the northern Oyo country for leather and the best quality leather goods, to certain Akiti towns for different types of pots as well as certain types of cloth, to the Akure and Owo areas for the best cosmetic camwood and some types of cloth, to Ife for beads and beaded products. The manufacturing enterprise of dyeing, of yarn and fabrics, deserves some note, because of its importance in the economy. Every community had at least a few dyeing establishments known as Idiaro where giant pots were sunk in the ground for compounding and holding dye solutions. These facilities were major pillars of the cloth industry the largest industrial enterprise of the Yoruba people. Usually, Idiaro were owned by the richest women in the community. They were very expensive to establish, since each of the giant pots normally cost a fortune. They usually passed from mother to daughter over many generations, and, therefore to own one was, in most cases, to be a descendant of a long line of rich people and the Idiaro was invariably a good and lucrative investment. The owner usually owned a large yarn and cloth production business of her own based on her Idiaro. In addition, 
she made a good income from the fact that her EDRO regularly served very many small yarn and cloth producers persons who would rent pots, for compounding dye solutions and then dyeing whatever they chose, for a length of time, and others who would only come to dye some piece of yarn or fabric and dye solutions already prepared by the facility owner. Most Yoruba dyeing had the objective of producing various shades of two basic colors blue and black, from the lightest blue all the way to the darkest black. This was because indigo was the most easily produced and commonly used dye. Production of other colors, especially shades of red and brown, was usually a specialized process, carried out with different types of dye solutions by persons with special training for it. Most brown or brownish-gray fabrics were not woven from dyed cotton yarn, but from naturally brown or brownish-gray yarn derived from a species of silkworm that grew on the bark of a tree found in the Yoruba forests. A French slave trader on the West African coast in the early 18th century, as will be seen below, described this brown or brownish-gray cloth, the highly prized fabric which the Yoruba called sanyan, as cloth made of the bark of trees. Commerce All the developments of the period added up to create enormous benefits for trade. The emergence of kingdoms, cities and towns opened up the country by developing and strengthening the channels of transportation and communication. Regional diversity in agricultural products, and the growth of regional specialization in manufactures, pushed up the volumes of internal trade. Generally increasing agricultural and industrial productivity generated increasing exports to places within and beyond Yoruba land. Increasing sophistication of economic demands consequent upon growing urbanization boosted the volume of imports from distant lands. The Yoruba became a great trading people, their women, especially, ranking among the best traders in Africa. Long-distance traders called Lahapa began to rank among the elite. Every one of the Yoruba cities, with its king's marketplace, became an emporium, generating, receiving, distributing and sending out merchandise on a large scale. In very distant parts of the West African region, Yoruba trading colonies emerged as far north as the Hausa country beyond the River Niger and the Kanuri country on Lake Chad and also far eastwards and westwards. Some Yoruba traditions even seem to suggest that Yoruba trading colonies might have existed as far west as the valley of the Senegal River and as far east as the lands of the Congo. Inside Yoruba land itself, Hausa and Nuuk trading communities arose in most cities, and traders from even further north, especially Tuaregs from the Sahara, became frequent features of the trading population. So much regard was had for the Hausa and Nuuk trading communities that Yoruba kings generally became their patrons, and many a king set aside space for them to live in or near his palace, close to the king's marketplace. When increasing numbers of the Hausa traders came to be Muslims, Yoruba cities usually gave them land to build their mosques close to the marketplace so they could observe their prayer breaks near their merchandise. In eastern and southern Yoruba land, Edo resident trading communities emerged in many towns. The coming of European trade. The above then, is our picture of the economic life of Yoruba land before the coming of European trade in the 16th century. From the founding of the first Yoruba kingdom, Ife, until the early 16th century, the trans-Saharan trade networks provided the major links between Yoruba land and the economies of the wider world outside of Africa. These trans-Saharan links had been in existence even before the founding of the Ife kingdom, and had contributed to the factors that had produced it. Thereafter, they had continued to be important in the economy of Yoruba land as channels of imports from, and exports to, distant parts of the world the Mediterranean Basin, the Middle East, Asia, and Europe. From the early 16th century, however, a major, totally different, new channel of contacts with the wider world emerged namely overseas routes between the coasts of West Africa and Europe. The Trans-Saharan channels continued in existence, of course, but they quickly became much less important than the channels over the Atlantic Ocean. The first Europeans to come to the coasts of West Africa were the Portuguese, who were seeking a sea route around Africa to Asia. They came to the coast of Benin in the 1470s. By then, the Benin Kingdom and most of the Yoruba kingdoms were already mature states, and some of them, like Ife, Benin, Ilesa, Ijebuode, Ou, Odondo, Owo, Oyoila, Ila, and some of the Akiti kingdoms, were already substantial. Trading and Expansionist States According to Ila Palace traditions, the king of Benin sent envoys to inform the Orangun as well as other kings, like the Uni of Ife, the Oavilesa and the Ui of Adu, that some strange white people had visited his kingdom, and some of these kings sent envoys down to Benin to go and see the white people. The envoys returned home with gifts of European articles for their kings from the Oba of Benin especially pieces of European velvet cloth. The Ui who first wore such velvet clothing was given the cognomen Oamu Aran, the king who wears the velvet cloth. 
the Portuguese established a trading station, called a factory, at the Benin port town of Ugotan, Guardo, and other stations at other places like Odeitsukiri. At these places, they bought peppers, ivory, elephant tusks, cloth woven in Benin and Yoruba land, dye stuff, etc. The cloth was sold further west on the coast, especially in exchange for gold, which was derived from Mina, in present-day Ghana. The imports included various European manufacturers' cloth, metal implements like knives, swords and domestic utensils, ceramic ware, beads, alcoholic beverages, royal luxury articles such as ceremonial umbrellas, expensive cloth, carpets and bugles. Benin traders took these imports to distribute in the interior, mostly in Yoruba land, and brought back from their articles for export, and the wealth and power of Benin were tremendously enhanced. Many towns in eastern and southern Yoruba land became important centers of Benin trade and housed large numbers of Benin traders. From the opening years of the 16th century, European coastal traders established more and more trading locations on the coasts of the Bights of Benin and Biafra. In general, the coasts of Yoruba land did not have natural harbors capable of taking large ships. European traders were attracted by the island of Echo, which the Portuguese began to call Lagos, but the approaches to it were made very difficult by sandbars. On the Ijebu and Dilahay coasts, there was no access even comparable to Lagos. As a result, the major centers of European trade with the Yoruba interior developed away from the Yoruba coasts in Benin on the western delta of the Niger to the east, and on the Asia coast to the west, where the Asia town of Afra became the leading port, to be superseded in the late 17th century by the port of Wita. Still, some trade with Europeans started on the Yoruba coast, especially at Lagos and on the Ijebu coast, and grew slowly during the 16th century. As would be remembered, these coasts had long been part of an ancient lagoon route connected to the Yoruba interior especially through the Ijebu country and the Ogun River. Later, in the early 18th century, Badagri emerged as a new port near Lagos. Although on a smaller scale than through Benin, European goods entered through the Yoruba coastal towns into Yoruba land, a considerable part of such goods penetrating through the coastal Ijebu towns. Increasingly during the following three centuries, European industrial products became part of the life of Yoruba people. Possession of exotic European goods, like clothing, jewelry, cookware, enamelware, liquor, mugs, even fancy bottles for presenting liquor or palm wine, became part of the symbols of status in Yoruba society. European traders also brought cowries from the Indian Ocean. Strangely, even though the Benin Kingdom started in about the 16th century to employ some European guns in its wars in parts of Yoruba land, no Yoruba kingdom armed its soldiers with European guns until the close of the 18th century. Patterns in Internal Trade The cobweb of trade routes linking all parts of Yoruba land from the beginning of the era of the kingdoms in about the 10th century, to the time of the coming of European trade in the 16th century, was essentially a development on route patterns that had long existed, about which much has earlier been said. The growth of trade with Europeans along the coast from the 16th century gradually transformed trade and modified the pattern of trade routes. One important change was the rise in the commercial importance of the Yoruba coastal towns like Odeitsukiri and Lagos. In spite of the natural obstacle to port activities in Lagos, the volume of its trade as a port slowly grew, and with that, the volume of the old lagoon trade around Lagos multiplied, and the short lagoon routes connecting the Ijebu coastal towns with Lagos assumed heightened importance generally strengthening such towns as Ikorodu, Igbagun, Ape, Ijinrin, Leki, and Makan. East of the Ijebu coast the Ilahe towns of Mohin, Ugbo and Atir saw more trade also, but their lack of direct entry to the sea caused them to remain small and insignificant. For much of the 16th century, in fact, the ports of the Benin Kingdom held the primacy of place among ports important to Yoruba land, and that boosted the importance of the routes through eastern Yoruba land Owo, the Akiti towns, Ilesa, Igbamana to Oyoila and the Noop country on the Niger. Towards the end of that century, with the development of the Asia coastal towns as important ports, routes southwestwards through Igbato, the far western Yoruba kingdoms, Kitu and others, and through the Asia country, gradually became Yoruba land's busiest routes, to which the trade of Oyoila came to be mostly channeled. With the rise of Oyoila as the greatest market town in Yoruba land from the late 16th century, Oyo shifted the preponderance of the trade generally westwards from Ife so that Ou more or less came to replace Ife as the preferred central channel of trade with Ijebu, a shift which benefited the Igbo towns considerably. The greatest beneficiaries of the general westward shift in trade, however, continued to be the Igbato towns. In the east, with the growth of trade directly northwards with Oyoila through Ijesa and with Nuplan through Igbamana, and directly southwards with Benin, 
the traditional commercial connection of the eastern Yoruba, Ekiti, Owo and Akoko, with Ife gradually shriveled. Owo continued to be a great center of trade, while Akoko and Ekiti towns northeast of Owo, on the corridor to the Noop country, grew very rapidly as trade centers. Ikar, Akuri, Ikir, Adu, Ara, Otun, Ekol and some other Ekiti towns became major market towns. Commercial transactions became so large and complex in Adu that one Yui of the late 17th century, Yui Oakan Rugban, the bearded king, set up at the gate of the Adu Palace, overlooking the marketplace, a powerful shrine named Asu Oakan Rugban, at which difficult commercial disputes could be resolved on oath. The Oi town of Igasi became a major center where Akiti, Akoko, Yagba, Owo, Benin and Ijesa traders met for trade. Owo, with its subordinate towns of Ida'aani and Okalus, remained always a significant junction of many routes and the entrepot at which much of Benin's trade with Yoruba land was done. A special market seems to have developed in a coal for the sale of undyed Akiti, Akoko, Igbamana and Yagba cloth, called Ala. In the Akoko country, a famous periodic marketplace named Osel developed, attracting Noop, Benin, Owo, Akiti, Okan Yoruba and other traders. As would be obvious from the above, the shifts in the paths of trade tended to leave the south-central parts of Yoruba land Ife southwards to Ondo, Ikale and Ilhe considerably lagging behind the regions to the west and east. In addition to those stated above, other reasons were the lack of any ports on the Ilhe coast to attract European trade, and the fact that the only river constituted a major obstacle and the road southwards to Odondo from Ife. Directly north from Odondo, Two towns arose on the banks of the Oni River to handle the trade and traffic across the river in Ondo town named Okigbo on the southern bank, and an Ife town called Ifatito on the northern bank. According to Ondo and Ife traditions, however, the river was too prone to flood in the area. Another Ondo town, Ikun, later known as Ileluji, further east in the same forest south of the Oni River, did not fare much better, in spite of its slightly better contact with Ilesa through the Ijesa villages of Odo and Iperindo in the forest north of the river. In the forest south of Odondo, the Ondo authorities established a trading outpost named Odigbo, literally, Forest Gate, as a junction of the north-south routes and the old east-west forest route from Owo through the Ondo country to the Ijebu country. These route pattern modifications fitted easily into the age-old complex of market centers linking all of Yoruba land together. As the country had developed, every town or village had one central marketplace and, depending on the size of the town or village, a number of smaller ones. Of such markets, some opened for trade mostly in the morning, others mostly in the late afternoon, from about 3 p.m. In 1826, in Oyoila, then the largest of all Yoruba cities, Clapperton saw seven different markets which are held about 3 or 4 o'clock. The central markets of the main cities and towns, as well as some of the lesser ones, were held every four days. The whole of Yoruba land had, over many centuries, evolved into market districts, of which there were hundreds. Each market district encompassed many towns and villages and therefore many marketplaces. Each market district was divided into a few subdistricts. The largest of the markets in each subdistrict were held every eight days and were therefore known as Oyeisan, nine-day markets. One or two markets close to the center and outer boundaries of the whole market district were held every 16 days, and were therefore known as Oyeidadogan, 17-day markets. The overall picture, then, was that the leaders of each market district were the Oyeidadogan. 17 day markets, the leaders of the market subdistrict were the Oya Isan, 9 day markets, and the leaders of the community markets were the Oya Orun, 5 day markets. Every marketplace had some small, residual, trading going on every day, usually in perishables like vegetables, peppers, and fruits. Then on every fourth day, the whole of a community converged on the Oya Orun markets, on every eighth day, the subdistrict converged on the Oya Isan markets and on every sixteenth day the whole district converged on the Oya and Adagan markets. The leader markets in each unit were staggered, so that the owner of a large trading business could take her outfit to as many as possible. The big traders usually knew the schedule for virtually all sub-district and district markets across the country. Usually, Oya Isan markets were much larger than Oya Orin markets, and Oya and Adagan markets were the largest, in some cases spreading over many tens of acres of land. The best known of these large periodic marketplaces was, besides Oyoila, Apamu, situated in Ife territory close to the junction of the territories of the Ife, Ou, Ijebu and Igba kingdoms. But a few others are also known, the Osel market in Ikar in the Okoko country, Igasi in the Oi kingdom in northern Akiti, Osogbo, a northern Ijesa town in the Osan Valley, close to the Oyo, Ife and Igbamana countries, Saki in the Oyo country. 
connected to the Igba, Igbado, Ife and Ou countries, and serving as a starting point of the road to the Bariba country and to Ganja, Akuri in the southern tip of Akiti serving the Akiti, Owo, Ondo, Benin and Ijesa countries, Okalus and Idaani and the Owo kingdom, serving Akiti, Akoko, Owonup, Benin, often Mayan Oak and Yoruba traders. Of the great market centers, the ones near the boundaries of Yoruba land with non-Yoruba people served as the links between the Yoruba homeland and these non-Yoruba territories. The market system in the Asia country was, however, essentially a western part of the Yoruba market system, and the Asia marketplaces were in every way Yoruba, filled invariably by Yoruba traders and conducting business in the Yoruba language. One description by a French slave trader on the coast of the Yoruba Asia region during the first years of the 18th century provides some idea of Yoruba Asia markets. Between 1702 and 1712, this trader visited the port towns of Wida and Aleta three times, and has left us the following description of a marketplace in that area. One beautiful morning, walking by the market where without exaggeration, there were more than 6,000 black men and women, I noticed several things which surprised me. The first was the order and the arrangement of the tents, the different quarters for each kind of merchandise, the peace and order which existed, this market, surrounded and decorated with trees, could probably be four times bigger than the new market in Amsterdam, where you have two or three thousand square feet, it was packed full like an egg. It was full of round tents covered with mats. At least there must have been about two hundred of them and in the center there was a small square place, about forty or fifty feet square, into which led all the roads. These roads were divided into sections, each section was reserved for only one type of merchandise or for those that are related to one another. In one section were the traders of tobacco and pipes. In another traders of dyed cloths, in another those of white cloths, here were mad traders and of baskets, there the sellers of boiled fish, sellers of palm oil occupy one area, while the sellers of cooking pots and earthen pots occupy another, fruit sellers were in their own places, those who sell legumes also were in theirs, sellers of cotton cloth and of cloth made out of bark of trees also had their particular places. In general, everything in this market is arranged in a manner to give pleasure, without confusion. In each section there are five or six tents where one buys food and also places where one buys drinks. I took notice that everything went on without noise, without quarrel, without shouting and in a most tranquil manner. When night approached, each one took his tent, folded his wares, and went away. About 100 years later, another traveler, the Englishman Hugh Clapperton, wrote the following description of another marketplace during a visit to the Yoruba interior. We came through the market, which, though nearly sunset, was well supplied with raw cotton, country cloths, provision, and fruit, such as oranges, limes, plantains, bananas, vegetables such as small onions, shallots, pepper and gum for soups, also boiled yams and acacians. Here the crowd rolled on like a sea, the men jumping over the provision baskets, the boys dancing under the stalls, the women bawling and saluting those who were looking after their scattered goods. Yet no word or look of disrespect to us. The Yoruba marketplace, then, was typically a pleasant place, laid out in order so that merchandise of the same type was displayed side by side. Shade trees, planted in some order, provided both shelter and decoration. Traders built their own tents in accordance with specifications acceptable to the authorities, especially to the leaderships of the market associations, or used portable tents. Sellers and buyers alike paid careful attention to the preservation of law and order, even though their haggling usually generated a lot of noise. Commotion or disruption in a marketplace was, among all Yoruba, regarded as a terrible omen, and saying that a town's marketplace broke down was equivalent to saying that the town itself broke down. Therefore, any breach of the peace in the marketplace was visited with very severe penalties and called for ritual sacrifices. The Yoruba marketplace was much more than a place of buying and selling, it was the heart of its community a place which exercised powerful influence on the government the place of some of society's most powerful shrines and rituals, the place where young people found and courted their future spouses. Sellers of the same or similar merchandise formed a commodity association, with its own officers, rules, rituals and festivals. These market commodity associations were the richest, and among the most influential, associations in every Yoruba community. Between them, they established the site rules for the marketplace and bore most of the responsibility for maintaining law and order there. The president of each association, with the title of Ilehe, was one of the most influential persons in society. The American Baptist missionary, D.J. Bowen, wrote in the 1850s an eyewitness account of one day in the life of a Yoruba marketplace which specialized in evening trade. In an evening market, some trading usually commenced early in the morning, for the sale of produce. 
Then in the late afternoon, as stated earlier, the real crowd of traders and buyers arrived. Bowen wrote. The most attractive next to the curious old town itself. Is the market. This is not a building but a large area shaded with trees, and surrounded and sometimes sprinkled over with low thatched roofs surmounted on rude posts. Here the women sit and chat all day, from early morning till 9 o'clock at night to sell their different merchandise. The principal marketing hour and the proper time to see all the wonders is in the evening. At half an hour before sunset, all sorts of people, men, women, girls, travelers, lately arrived in the caravans, farmers from the field and artisans from their houses, are pouring in from all directions to buy and sell and talk. At the distance of half a mile their united voices roar like the waves of the sea. The women, especially, always noisy, are then in their glory bawling out salutation, cheapening, giggling, conversing, laughing and sometimes quarreling, with a shrilling and compass of voice which indicates both their determination and their ability to make themselves heard. As the shade of the evening deepens, if the weather allows the market to continue and there is no moon, every woman lights her little lamp, and presently the market presents to the distant observer, the beautiful appearance of innumerable bright stars. Rooted in a local market, but operating far and wide in order to serve it in other markets, there were two classes of big traders. The first, known as the Ilarobo, did business as gatherers of local produce from the producers, for wholesale distribution to retailers in local markets. The other, known as the Ilahapa, did business as long-distance traders all over the Yoruba homeland and beyond, taking the products of one part of the country to local retailers in other parts. Persons engaged in these levels of commerce were usually the richest in society, and commanded large trading establishments employing large numbers of porters. The Ilahapa unusually became very knowledgeable about trading conditions in various parts of Yoruba land. Those of them who took trade beyond Yoruba land often became fluent in foreign languages. These owners of large trading businesses, and the numberless small traders, kept the roads throughout Yoruba land constantly busy. Human porters carried their goods. Usually, the big trader sent out large teams of porters in different directions, with herself leading the most important team, while members of her family or trusted servants led the others. After traveling over much of Yoruba land in the 1850s and meeting these teams everywhere, T.J. Bowen described Yoruba land as a land of caravans. Some caravans could number many hundreds of people. In some parts of the country, especially in the more open grassland areas of northern and western Yoruba land, horses played a small part in the carrying of people and of goods. The trade routes were paths trodden by humans, and, in some areas, horses, over many centuries. In accordance with ancient practices, each town cleared the sections of the paths that traversed its territory, the clearing being done on the days of certain festivals by the male population. According to Samuel Johnson, the paths in the Oyo area of northwestern Yoruba land were cleared twice a year during the Agungun and Ion, drum music, festivals. In the thick forests of the south, in the Ijebu, Igba, Ondo and Owo areas, clearing was done more often. Each kingdom was responsible for maintaining peace on the paths that went through its territory. Usually the paths were well maintained and protected. The authorities of kingdoms, towns and villages, had vested interests in ensuring good paths, since the best and safest paths attracted the most traders and trade. If there was some threat of danger on a road, the local authorities would usually send armed escorts to accompany the caravans. The English explorer, Clapperton traveled on the road from Badagri on the coast to Oyoila in 18,256 and his general assessment was that the road was good and peaceful, and quite pleasant in some sections. Unfortunately, the transcriber of his notes had difficulty with the Yoruba place names, as a result of which some of the towns visited by him are now impossible to identify. Between a town named Dagmu and his diary in the town of Ihumbo, Clapperton noted that the road surface was rather uneven and that the forest on either side of it was thick and impenetrable. Soon after, However, between Adalabolo and Iloro, the road lay through fine plantations of yams and was nearly as level as a bowling green. Between Iloro and Ayana, the road lay through large plantations of corn and yams and fine avenues of trees in some sections, and through plantations of millet, yams, avalanches, sick, and Indian corn in other sections. Between Ega and Imado, the road was a long broad and beautiful avenue of the tallest trees. Between Washu and Saki, the road lay through a mountain pass that was grand and imposing sometimes rising almost perpendicularly, and then descending in the midst of rocks into dells, then winding beautifully round the side of a steep hill. Of the towns that lay on Clapperton's route, he noted of Irua that it was large and very populous, and of Kooso, Koso, that it was a large walled town. 
these western parts of Yoruba land had started to experience minor political troubles by the time of Clapperton's 1825 visit. For instance, he wrote of one small town that it had suffered destruction and that its gate and the ditch are now all that remain. In spite of such political conditions, Clapperton met streams of traders on the road, all going about their business without molestation. He himself commented at a point that he had done 60 miles in eight days and changed carriers many times, and yet he had not had even the smallest thing stolen from him. Some three decades after 1825, by which time Yorubaland's political troubles had widened and deepened, many literate foreign travelers traversed the country, passing through many towns ruined or troubled by war. Even in such circumstances, they met streams of traders on the roads. From late 1855 to early 1856, the pioneer Anglican missionary, David Hinderer, accompanied by Dr. Irving, traveled from Ibad into Ijebuot at the invitation of the Awu Jali Adami Uofidipot. After leaving Ibadan, Hinderer and his companions passed through the ruins of many Igba towns. At Idamapa, the road divided, one arm going direct to Ijebuot and the other to the Ramo area. They chose the Ramo branch and, after passing through the ruins of a few more Igba towns, came to the Ramo town of Ipara, their first Ijebu town. In spite of the melancholy sight of ruined towns, Hinderer noted that a beautiful country opened before us on all sides. At Omi, they joined the company of a large caravan of Ijebu traders and, soon after, Hinderer noted that their path led through a most beautiful palm field, abundance of kola trees, most of the road from there to Ofen, and from Ofen to Ijebu Ode, was quite good, in spite of some political trouble on the approach to Ofen. It was during this visit that Hinderer described the ancient wall around Ijebu Ode, the Erido Sungbo, as a wonderfully deep trench. From Ijebu Ode they headed down to Ikarodu on the Ijebu Creeks. In 1855, A.C. Mann, a missionary based in I.J., traveled from I.J. to Aloran, passing through Ogbomoso and the ruins of the formerly great city of Ikoi. In 1858, Hinderer traveled the road from Mibadan to Iwo, Ed, Osogbo, Ilesa, Ilaife and Apamu. And in the same year, the American Baptist missionary, D.J. Bowen, and the English commercial traveler, Daniel May, traveled various roads that led to the Ijesa, Igbamana and Ekiti countries. It was during his travels in northern Ekiti that May met Asugbaibi building the town of Aid close to Isan. All of these travelers found that, in spite of wars in many places, the roads through Yorubaland were reasonably well maintained and safe, and carried a heavy traffic of traders. Fundamental Commercial Advantages For the establishment of this strong commercial civilization, the Yoruba people benefited from a number of initial fundamental advantages. The most important was that theirs was a large country linked closely together by one language and one culture the largest of such units of territory in all of the tropical forests of Africa. From the territories of the Okan Yoruba and the Akoko close to the western banks of the lower Niger, all the way westwards to the homelands of the Itcha and Ife of modern Benin and Togo, and from the seacoast northwards to latitude 9 north, on the southern banks of the river Niger, Yoruba land occupied about half of the West African tropical forests. Though this vast country was not one but many states, all its states had the same basic system of government, and all its people lived the same pattern of community and economic life, married and raised their children in more or less the same way, worshipped the same pantheon of gods and spirits, and spoke mutually intelligible dialects of the same language. In fact, by the time that the trade with Europe started, the Yoruba language had become the lingua franca for peoples beyond the Yoruba ethnic homeland. Writing about the Asia Kingdom of Alida in 1668, Dapper said, Their own mother tongue is by them little regarded, therefore they seldom speak it, but they are obliged to speak mostly Alkhamage which in their country is regarded as a noble language. One father Columbine of Nantes visited the coast of West Africa as head of the French mission in 1634 and 1640. In a letter to the higher authorities of the mission, he wrote as follows about the Benin Kingdom. In this kingdom the people may very easily be led to embrace the faith and priests can live here with greater ease than in other parts of Guinea because of the healthy climate, their language is simple, it is called Lycoman language and is universally used in these parts, just like Latin in Europe. Europeans along the West African coast call the Yoruba Lekumi, Lukumi or Alkaman, and endless variations of it, and the Yoruba language Alkamage, Lycoman, and other variations. Thus, Dapper's Alkamage and Father Columbine's Lycoman meant the same the Yoruba language. The use of the Yoruba language, therefore, linked together not only all parts of the Yoruba homeland but also areas extending beyond. As earlier pointed out, the Asia country, commercially, was essentially part of Western Yoruba land. Such an expansive cultural and linguistic continuum provided great opportunities for commercial development. 
the creation of the Yoruba cities and towns, some housing the thrones of kings, all ruled by well-organized governments, was another important factor. It opened up and civilized the Yoruba forest and grass homeland and turned it into a land wherein people could roam at will. Finally, the whole of the Yoruba homeland, together with its cultural and economic extensions to the east and west, had one single common monetary system, one currency namely cowries. In the whole area, cowries were an ancient currency. From their earliest contacts with the Benin and Yoruba coastland in the early 16th century, European traders found cowries as its common currency. One French trader wrote in the 18th century, cowries are the currency of the country and consequently they are accepted for all goods, even gold, which they regard as no more than an article of trade. Among the blacks you can buy with cowries anything that gold or silver will buy in Europe. A small amount of trade by barter seems to have survived in some parts of the country until the 19th century, for example, the exchange of beets for other goods, but in general, cowries were the currency, and its value was roughly the same in most parts, though there were minor differences in some places. To make trade easier, even European traders had to harmonize their own currencies with the cowrie currency, determining how many cowries were equivalent to their own pound or franc. The existence of the common currency and cowries facilitated trade in the broad region comprising the Yoruba, Edo and Asia countries and even beyond. The Impact of the Atlantic Slave Trade In the opening years of the 16th century, some slaves became part of the export cargo on European ships leaving the port of Benin. Some of the first slaves were taken to supply labor to the islands off the coast of West Africa, Sao Tome, Principe and Fernando Po, where the Europeans began to develop plantations of sugar cane. Some were also taken to Europe as domestic servants. Then, as various European nationalities, Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, French and English, acquired islands in the West Indies and embarked on large-scale plantations there and in Brazil, the demand for slaves increased, and these nations entered into the transatlantic slave trade on a big scale. By the beginning of the 17th century, slaves were already dominating the export trade from the coasts of West Africa and Central Africa, that is, Angola and the Congo region. The ports on the Asia coast, Wita, Jaikin, Afra, Apa and, late Rajas or Porto Novo, and the ports of the Niger Delta east of Benin, Calabar, Bani and New Calabar, handled the overwhelming part of slave exports from the Bights of Benin and Biafra for about 250 years, from the early 16th century to about the middle of the 18th century. Compared to these, the number of slaves exported from the coasts of Yoruba land during the 16th and 17th centuries was small. The Portuguese trader, Duarte Pacheco Pereira, wrote in the 16th century about the Ijebu coast that the trade which one can conduct here is the trade in slaves, who are sold for brass bracelets, at the rate of 12 to 15 bracelets for a slave, and in elephant's tusks. Some slaves were exported from some parts of the Yoruba coasts, then, but these were, according to available data, few. Small too was the number of Yoruba exported from the port of Benin and from the ports of the Asia coast. In short then, during the 16th and 17th centuries and the first half of the 18th, 1500-1750, the number of persons exported from Yoruba land as slaves was small according to some estimates about 240,000, that is less than an average of 1,000 slaves per year. And probably most of these were not persons of Yoruba descent, since Yoruba people bought many slaves from the Noop, Borgu and the House on and beyond the Niger whom they then sold on the coast, and since the Oyo people, beginning from the 17th century, sold many of their Noob, Bariba and Asia captives products of the Oyo Wars of Expansion. Why then were Yoruba people so comparatively little involved as part of enslaved human exports from West Africa from the 16th to the middle of the 18th century? Historians have suggested various answers to this question. Most believe that the answer is to be found in the fact that Yoruba land in general was comparatively peaceful through most of this long period. Conflicts occurred between Yoruba kingdoms in a number of regions of the country but these were mostly local affairs of usually short duration and small impact. Much more important than such conflicts was the general belief among Yoruba kings that they belonged to one family. Of that family, the most powerful from the 17th century was the Alafin of Oyo, and the available evidence indicates that most other Yoruba kings recognized him as their powerful brother, while many of the kingdoms, like most of the Igbamana kingdoms, and many other kingdoms in the far west, the Igba and Ou kingdoms, were absorbed, with varying statuses under the Alafin's overlordship. But military conquest does not seem to have been Oyo's usual way of dealing with other Yoruba states. Oyo's great wars of expansion were fought not against Yoruba kingdoms but against non-Yoruba peoples like the Bariba of Borgu, the Noop, and the Asia. 
to the Igbomina country for instance, Oyo armies came, not to conquer the Igbomina, but to expel the Nupu who were making a strong bid over that part of northern Yoruba land. And, according to Biobaku, the establishment of Oyo's suzerainty over the Igba was accomplished without violence, and the Igba were pleased to have the Ilafin's protection. Widespread traditions indicate quite clearly also that the Ilafin frequently employed his enormous influence to settle disputes between Yoruba kingdoms and even within some kingdoms. From the southeast, the Benin kingdom was a great power like Oyo, but, on the whole, the Benin kingdom was much more a great trading power in southern Yoruba land than anything else. Benin did not employ its power in endless or even frequent aggression and raids but in sharp, focused, actions that were meant to deal with particular, mostly commercial, problems, and for long periods in the 17th and 18th centuries Benin did not, or could not, launch such actions. Among Benin's neighbors in southern and eastern Yoruba land, its image in general was not that of a raider but that of a strong, well-ordered, kingdom that insisted on being respected in particular, on having its traders treated well. On the whole, the power and influence of Oyo in the northwest and the power and influence of Benin in the southeast were together strong guarantees of order and peace in the Yoruba Edo world. Old sayings and proverbs among the Akiti portray the two as pillars of order. The very nature of Yoruba society itself seems to have been fundamental to this fabric of order and peace. The lineage in its Agboila was a formidable guarantor of respect for its members. It was also a formidable defense for strangers lodged under its shelter whether permanent or long-time residents or transient travelers. Abusing or violating a member of a lineage, or a stranger resident with it, was usually sure to lead to civil commotion. It was a grave matter when a lineage complained that the king or chief had ill-treated its members, and, historically, many kings' troubles with the political system started from such complaints. One of the early kings of Ife was assassinated in the streets during a festival procession, and one of the reasons given in the traditions is that he had laid hold on a man and sacrificed him during a ritual as a result of which he had angered the man's lineage and other lineages related to it. The honor of the lineage was very important to its members, and every lineage had close connections with some others. In the plural society that was every Yoruba community, people in general, and the rulers in particular, were customarily cognizant and respectful of these facts. Beyond each community too, governments behave towards one another in much the same way. Respect for persons from other communities was strict law in every Yoruba community. A community that, for whatever reason, sought trouble with its neighbor would usually attack the neighbor's citizens who had come to trade or to do other business, knowing quite well that the authorities of that other community were almost sure to respond with some aggressive action. All these patterns of sensitivity, then, tended to protect the individual and his freedom and dignity. It was crucial to the freedom with which Yoruba traders, mostly women, herbalists, diviners, entertainers and others endlessly traverse their country to ply their trades. Even in spite of disruptions caused by long wars in Yoruba land in the second half of the 19th century, the culture of widespread, long-distance, trade and travel proved irrepressible. Concerning the sources of the few Yoruba persons who ended up as enslaved exports from the 16th century to the end of the 17th century, the available evidence is not very strong. It seems fairly certain that most Yoruba governments came to adopt the practice of authorizing the sale of convicts especially hardened criminals who were embarrassments to their lineages and had been renounced by them. Richard Lander noted, during his visit to Oyoila in 1826, the age-old Yoruba practice of dealing with such a convict. The ministers of justice would, he said, inflict incisions over his facial marks, thus irreversibly disfiguring him. This was a notice to society that the man had been rejected, renounced and expunged by his lineage. Usually, he would run away to some distant place, but even there he would suffer lifelong rejection and scorn and die miserably. With the coming of the Atlantic slave trade, such criminals were authorized to be taken to the coast and sold to European traders but their numbers were, on the whole, small. Some other slave exports Almost certainly the overwhelming majority of Yoruba in slave exports in the 16th and 17th centuries resulted from occasional invasions of Yoruba frontier territories by non-Yoruba neighbors. Although the Oyo armies had expelled the Nupe from the northern and northeastern parts of Yoruba land in the early 17th century, the Nupe never ceased sporadic incursions into the countries of the Igbomina, the Okan Yoruba, the northern Ekiti and the Akoko. Captives from these raids were usually sold into slavery and formed part of the slaves from the Nupe country that found their way into slave ships along the coast through the labyrinth of mostly concealed slave routes to the coast. Also, although the Benin Kingdom was essentially not a slave raiding state, some more captives from Benin wars in eastern Yoruba land were sold as slave exports. And, in the far western region of Yoruba land, 
the rising kingdom of Dahomey from the late 17th century embarked on much military activity among other Asia and neighboring Yoruba peoples, as a result of which some Yoruba were among the increasing numbers of slaves sold at the ports of the Asia coast. Some historians have suggested that a good part of Yorubas who ended up on slave ships were domestic slaves. The supposition is that, before the coming of Europeans the institution of domestic slavery was common and widespread in Yoruba land, that domestic slaves were a substantial part of labor in the Yoruba economy, and that when Europeans came asking for slaves, Yoruba owners of slaves had them to sell. It has been assumed that there was, among every African people, a large class of domestic slaves waiting to be sold to Europeans. In recent studies, however, this view has been shown to be untrue about many African peoples, for example, Walter Rodney has shown that among the peoples of the Upper Guinea coast there was no slave class waiting to be sold to European slave traders. Similar conclusions appear to be true of Yoruba land. In his thesis on the Owo Kingdom, Oladipo Olugbadian finds that Benin traders, increasingly active in Owo from as early as the 14th century, never bought slaves in Owo because, according to him, there were no slaves to buy. Benin invasions occasionally produced Owo war captives, some of whom were sold into the coastal trade. Similarly, no Akiti traditions speak of Benin traders buying slaves in any Akiti town, but traditions of Akiti communities and lineages losing some members to Benin invasions abound. What would seem to have been the case is that there were indeed domestic slaves in Yoruba society long before the coming of Europeans, but that selling and buying of slaves was rare. A person captured in any of the few internal wars of the Yoruba kingdoms became an Eru meaning, roughly, a slave. Usually, many, often most, of the Eru would end up as palace servants, and the king would reward the most worthy of his chiefs, especially the war chiefs, with the rest. This made the owning of Eru virtually an exclusive preserve of the powerful and influential, before domestic slavery became common and widespread in the 19th century. Also, before the Eru status became grossly degraded in the 19th century, an Eru was only technically a slave. If he served the palace, there was no status difference between him and other palace servants, his rank and how high he could rise in the king's service, depended on his character and capabilities. In palaces all over Yoruba land, persons who came as Eru commonly rose to the highest and most influential of positions and even married king's daughters. If an Eru belonged to someone lower than the king he could, besides serving his master, raise crops of his own, on the farmland of his master's lineage, or establish some other enterprise. Unless he had some serious character blemish, he could, and often would, marry his master's relative or even daughter and that would usually transform him into a member of the lineage, with nearly all the rights and privileges of membership. If there was a chieftaincy title in the lineage, he could not, usually, aspire to it, but as sons later could, he could also inherit from his master's belongings. He could serve in the king's armed forces if war came, and distinguished performance there would usually raise him to honor and influence. Character was, for an Eru, the ill-decisive factor. If an Eru exhibited extremely poor character and committed criminal or shameful acts, his master could punish him. However, it was a serious crime to kill an Eru or subject an Eru to life-threatening treatment. Universal fear of hurting an Eru, and thereby committing a serious crime, is, according to Chief Isolof Abunmi of Ife, illustrated by the dire warning expressed in the words of this old Ife folk song. Monarlo I must leave you O cool you fool of a coward, ah be Eruja. You want to fight an Eru? Be Araba run if the air dies by your hand, K.O.A.T. say? What are you going to do? In fact, the master's penal authority over his Eru covered small domestic offenses only, if the Eru committed a serious crime, the master could not usurp the judicial and penal authority of the state. Legally, a master could sell his Eru, but selling was not a common part of the system. Selling was punishment an extreme act of rejection and renunciation, and it was not commonly resorted to. And there is some evidence that selling was not even a decision that the master could take entirely on his own without the input of the people of his lineage compound. Hence the saying Bio Bata Eru Pioo, Ayoro Amoni. If an Eru is to be sold, the decision would have to be taken by a caucus of the free people of the lineage. Some corroboration for this is provided by Richard Lander, visiting Yoruba land in 18,256 and in 1830. Lander wrote that the conditions of slaves in Yoruba society were much better than those of slaves of European planters in the Americas or even of slaves employed as domestic servants in European homes. Of the domestic slave in Yoruba society he wrote, If his character be good and his honesty unquestioned, the slave, is admitted into the house of his master, placed on an equality with himself and male children, thrusts his hand into the same bowl of toi, food, as they, shares their confidence, 
and participates in all their pleasures and amusements. Concerning the selling of domestic slaves, Lander wrote, an instance is never known of a dependent, domestic slave, having an unblemished character, and active industrious habits, being sent to the coast to be sold, in fact everyone considers this to be the greatest punishment that can be inflicted upon him, those, domestic slaves, sent to the seaside from the interior are invariably the scum and refuse of the country freebooters, lawless refractory fellows, adulterers, and even murderers. And the available evidence strongly indicates that, as would be remembered, even such persons were few on the slave ships before the late 18th century. In summary, in the present state of our knowledge, the available evidence would seem to suggest the following picture concerning the part played by domestic slavery in the sale of Yoruba people into the Atlantic slave trade. Before the advent of European coastal trade, there existed in Yoruba land certain types of subordinate statuses of which servitude was a component notably the Iwofa and Eru systems. The Iwofa system never involved sale of persons, the Eru system could, but did so very infrequently. Neither, legally, permitted inhuman handling of the subordinate persons. The slave trade with Europeans on the coast from the 16th century started to generate slaves from various other sources essentially from among captives in ongoing wars, rather than from any pre-existing domestic pool. Of such wars some were local wars between Yoruba states, others were invasions of Yoruba land by non-Yoruba neighbors, like Benin, the Nup and the Bariba, and yet others were Yoruba invasions of the countries of non-Yoruba neighbors, Oyo invasions of Nup, Bariba and Asia territories. Among the Yoruba, the Oyo being rulers and citizens of the most powerful, and expansionist, Yoruba kingdom, and being almost perpetually at hostility with non-Yoruba neighbors, became the most drawn into the slave trade, selling their war captives, and buying other slaves from the Nup, Bariba, Hausa and Asia for sale. The Oyoila kingdom started to expand over one century after the coming of European coastal trade, and independently of it. Oyo's widening expansion and the growth of the coastal trade coincided as major developments of the 17th and 18th centuries. In the process, the two developments converged and, by the late 18th century, Oyo had become a considerable slave trading power, deriving some growing wealth from the sale of slaves. Tapping into the slave trade became more and more attractive to ambitious Oyo people, and by the last decades of the 18th century, many prominent Oyo men and women were involved in the trade. Oyo's trade in slaves brought coast-bound slaves through many of Yoruba land's trade routes especially the trade routes passing through the Ou and Dijebu territories, and the Igba, Igbato and far western Yoruba territories. In these places, the people living near the coast became the middlemen on the trade, buying from the Oyo traders and selling to the Europeans on the coast. Of such middlemen, the Ijebu became the most numerous and richest. One of the results of the growing trade in slaves was the expansion of personal ownership of domestic slaves, especially in the Oyo country, but also in other parts of Yorobland, particularly places close to the ports Ijebu, Awari, Igbado and the farther western Yoruba subgroups. Another, according to widespread Yoruba traditions, was the beginning and growth of kidnapping of people for sale, mostly to coast-bound traders. Kidnappings were probably few, but they were made to seem numerous by rumors and popular fears, therefore, it is not surprising that the authorities in many kingdoms took action against kidnapping. It was most probably in order to keep out strangers who might be kidnappers that the Ijebuot authorities turned their great city into a land where strangers who could not give clear accounts of themselves faced the danger of being arrested and sacrificed at the shrines. Ilesa traditions are unambiguous that some of the skulls displayed on the Ilesa city walls were of suspicious strangers. And Adu, Akiti. Traditions speak of suspicious strangers dragged to the palace and made to swear at the Asuokan Rugban shrine, or sacrificed at the shrine if their accounts of themselves proved unsatisfactory. Both the slave trade and slavery gradually grew, in the western parts of Yoruba land more than in the eastern. During the late 18th century ultimately, as will be seen in subsequent chapters, reaching a climax by the second quarter of the 19th century as a result of the Yoruba wars of that century. In the 250 years between 1500 and 1750, in summary, the effects of the slave trade on Yoruba land would seem to have been almost unnoticeable. The number of Yoruba people involved in slave exports was generally small. In terms of regions of Yoruba land, the most affected in these years, especially from the 17th century, would seem to have been eastern Yoruba land as a result of Benin invasions in Owo, Akiti, and Akoko, and new progression in the countries of the Igbamana, Okan Yoruba, Akoko and parts of northern Ekiti and northern Ijesa. Of the comparatively few Yoruba persons exported as slaves during these 250 years, the majority most probably came from these places. Of the rest, 
a slowly increasing number would have come from the regions of Yorubaland more directly exposed to the influence of the coastal trade Ijebu, Awari, Igbado, Igba, Oyo, and the various Yoruba subgroups in the southern parts of the modern Benin Republic, Ahori and others. These western subgroups would also have increased in the slave exports from about the late 17th century as a result of the rise of the Dahomey Kingdom and its tendency to aggression against its neighbors. The expansion of Oyo towards the southwest from the end of the 17th century, while greatly increasing the number of Asia slave exports, would also have increased the number of Oyo elements ending up on slave ships. In the last 50 years of the 18th century, 17,501,800, most of the above trends gradually intensified and produced marked increases in the number of Yoruba people being exported as slaves, resulting in an estimated total of about 300,000 for the 50 years. For instance, new progression intensified in the lands of the Igbamana, Okan Yoruba, Akoko and northern Ekiti. Increased participation in the slave trade by Oyo people, as well as the gradual deterioration of security in the Oyo homeland owing to growing political instability, markedly increased the number of Oyo elements in the slave exports. All these and other factors continued to intensify into the 19th century, resulting in sharp increases in the number of enslaved Yoruba people being exported in the course of its first half.